Well, welcome to this video. Always a pleasure to have uh, Professor Tim Spector on the channel. Welcome to. Hello there. Great to be back. And thank you on behalf of myself and all of our viewers that you've been sharing the Zoe data with us, which has uh, really been quite fascinating. We get it hot off the press every every Thursday. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to have that so, uh, so fresh. Just before we start, Tim, while there's only two of us here, I know you're a physician with a, with a specialist uh, interest in, in metabolic health. Um, just a personal problem. I, I'm, I'm quite like to lose five, ten kilograms. And um, I wanted to know, do you, do you think intermittent fasting is an effective way for me to lose weight? Uh, well, intermittent fasting is a broad church of different approaches. Some of them actually involve fasting where you reduce calories. And certainly those ones, you will reduce weight short term. But it's unclear whether that is going to bounce straight back again after about six weeks. And then there's other ones where you eat the same amount, but you're eating within a different time window. And that's called time restricted eating. And that is where I think most of the real interesting focus is now, uh, research wise. And a lot of the studies are showing that just by changing the times you eat, not what you eat, you can improve your metabolic health your blood sugar levels, your blood fat levels, your cardiovascular risk, etc., uh, potentially your energy levels, etc. And some people, uh, not everybody, some people uh, can lose weight. And this is really something we're interested in at the moment because the data so far are either done on animals or they're done in uh, lots of small, very highly controlled studies that don't really mimic real life. And what we'd love to do is to really see you know, if we take half a million people uh, doing this and they all shift their eating times a little bit, a couple of hours, what effect does it have on their energy levels, their mood, their hunger, their sleep patterns and their weight? And that's exactly what we want to find out because I can't tell you John, whether someone like you of your age and your, your BMI, whether you're going to do well on this system or not. And it also depends you know, your environment and what your current eating times are, which, we, you know, everyone's going to vary. Everyone's going to have different circumstances. So this is a, a chance for everyone um, you know, to do this. And that's where we're, we're calling for volunteers for this study. So we could find this out, hopefully, in the next few months. It might be possible that I can eat the same as I'm eating now, but just eat at different times and l lose a few kilograms. That would be that would be ideal. Yeah, I mean, I think what we find is that when you when you tell people to eat in a shorter time frame, uh, they naturally tend to eat slightly less anyway, without really thinking about it, just because you know you you, you don't instantly go for those extra snacks or you don't grab that last biscuit or bit of cheese before going to bed you think about it a bit more sensibly right so we we sort of we always have this temptation around us but if someone's saying okay you know actually this could be good for you and this increasing that overnight fast um we know helps the body repair itself we know that it helps the microbes repair the gut and it's generally good for our immune system so uh, it, it sort of makes sense that we should all try it, but it's quite possible that only some people are going to benefit, not everybody. And that's really why, because, you know, as you know, I'm a big believer in this personalised approach to nutrition and many other things, really, lifestyle as well. It's like exercise doesn't suit everybody. Um, and we have to try and find which, which, which lifestyle approaches to health work best for us and which are too much effort. And I think this massive study, if we get... What I want to get is like half a million people participating, all doing the, the study at roughly the same time. Individuals will find out what works for them and we'll feed those results back to them. But also they'll see how they do in comparison to other people of the same age. And I think mm -hmm. that's the exciting thing. In a bit like we did with the COVID study, giving people lots of feedback, uh, you know, about whether their symptoms were average or not or what things were going on. It's the same principle we want to do, and we're calling this the big IF study. IF because it stands for intermittent fasting, but also IF because we don't know 
a lot of things about intermittent fasting and we'd love to find out what really works in practice for the, you know, the average person. And we see the countdown to the beginning of the study there, Tim, not in lifetime. That was about 20 minutes ago. So, uh, And we can register for this, it looks like. Yeah. So uh, uh, pre-register now online. You can, yeah, and, it, and if you go on and down, the key is to downloading the, the, um, the app, the Zoe Health Study app. It's the same one that uh, the people who are logging the COVID are already doing, but those who aren't doing it can just log on just to do this study if they want. They're not as interested in, in logging for COVID. That's absolutely fine. And we want people to share it widely. Uh, if you want your friends and family to also do this experiment at the same time, it's a great um, way to do that and see if you can shift the whole family's eating habits and see how they feel and see if the kids, you know, and your parents or whatever, you know, feel the same way about it as you do. So I think uh, I'm, I can't wait to uh, uh, find out these results. And, and this, hopefully, if it works, is going to be the first of many lifestyle experiments that we can do um, in, all, in all areas where we really don't know the truth and that we have to, you know, so often in science we're basing all our recommendations on like 20 people uh, done multiple times but in a very different scenario to the way we live our lives. So, yeah, join up, everybody, share it. That would be fantastic. Let's make this as big a success as the, uh, the COVID app was. Well, I'm going to register, Tim, because I think it's great for science. It's a lot of uh, mass data. But also I want to find out if it works for me personally. So it's kind of killing two birds with one stone there, which is, is what I want to do. And, and just in terms of weight loss, Tim, could just in a sentence or two, can you summarise what we've learned so far, or what you've learned from the Zoe data so far on how to optimise metabolic health in terms of eating plants and, the, you know, the things that are important. Yeah, so the data we've got comes from either epidemiology experiments that I've been doing for the last 10 years with twins, etc., plus the Zoe Predict studies where we've been given people identical meals and seeing how their responses to food. And um, that's now part of the commercial product that is live in the US and, and the UK where and so we know from the epidemiology studies and we're just starting to replicate it in the Zoe studies that eating a diverse range of plants is really important for your gut health and with this the magic figure of 30 a day 30 a week I should say is what we're aiming for we, we may refine that number as we get more information um, and mainly brightly coloured plants with polyphenols, these defence chemicals, eating fermented foods and avoiding ultra-processed foods. They're the, they're the sort of standard way to get your health. But in the PREDICT studies, we've shown that people who have high peaks and dips after eating carbohydrates are more at risk of inflammation, metabolic uh, ill health, and slowly putting on weight. And so the other side of the coin is to try and find foods that suit you that don't give you these big fat and sugar peaks and often they're in ultra processed foods anyway but sometimes they can be in natural foods the things that we, we regard as healthy like a, an oat porridge for example hmm. um, that many people regard as a healthy way and was told to reduce cholesterol in the 1980s but we now know for many people that's actually an unhealthy food because it will give them, like me, a big sugar spike and make me hungrier, make me overeat, cause inflammation and uh, ultimately, you know, over longer term, make me gain weight. So I think this is, this is the, the new, what the new science is teaching us. It's a very different way of looking at food. And um, uh, you know, this is why I think this new science is really starting to help us reevaluate um, food in a, in a very different way. And that's... Um, Part of why I write my books, and uh, my new book's coming out next week, by the way, John. Um, I think uh, I've sent you a copy yet. Have you seen it yet? I don't know. I've been one. looking forward to it, Tim. Food uh, for Life. No, I haven't seen that one, no. It's, no. it's a bit of a, ch it's a chunky read. It's going to, yeah, it it's look, going to take you more than a night to read it, but. Yeah. Because it's really an A to Z of foods this time. So rather than just the theory of what we're talking about, it actually gives some practical guides to um, how to eat. And. Uh, tables about you know which foods rank for me highest and lowest with some surprising ones and you know even within breads for example there's a tenfold difference uh, in fiber levels in what look like healthy breads mm. and 
poly, you know, and, and so there's all kinds of different ways now looking at food with this new science that I think everyone needs to uh, get themselves up to speed on so they can make the right choices and not rely on NHS or government's uh, guidelines or labels on foods, which I think are totally misleading and uh, lead people down to eat actually very unhealthily when if they knew more, they could you know, be making those right choices. So uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting time in nutrition. Definitely. Mm. I know since I've done the study, I certainly think about when I'm shopping, how to get a wide variety of plants and the things that work for me and the things that don't work for me. But I think it's fair to say the ultra processed foods are pretty bad for, for everyone. They're the things we really need to cut out if we want to be serious about metabolic health. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, 60% of the American diet is made of ultra processed food and 50, 53% in the UK. And we often don't realise that they are ultra processed uh, because they've got healthy labels on them. They've got things like low fat, uh, low calorie, uh, extra vitamins, um, omega three. You know all these, uh, all these signs that uh, you know the vitamin D that you love, John. You know, um, but it's all to disguise the poor quality yeah. of the food. And that basically, good food doesn't need a flashy label. Um, yeah. it's there you know yeah. it uh, it doesn't need advertising if you understand what whole foods are real foods and so it, it is this educational process but in the real world again we don't live in cocoons we can't avoid processed hmm. or ultra processed foods it's virtually impossible so we have to learn which are the least bad or which ones just to have occasionally and which ones uh, you know it might be okay to have regularly mm -hmm. but I think we we never we never really look at the full choice and you've probably seen this now now you're using the, the Zoe app you know many more things you wouldn't have thought of mm. putting in your diet you do when you're prompted in this way and I think it, the nice thing is it does get us out of ruts and mm. um, uh, but how, how have you found it to use have you found your easy to get your, your high scores um, or not, is it not, tough not particularly there's a few foods that aren't readily available in quite a few supermarkets see even fermented foods aren't that readily available apart from the sort of pasteurized forms so um i've been having a go at making my own but i think i think we need uh, a, a change in the individual but a change you're in, in the, the far north you're in the far north there, retailers John. not that far just just nine miles south of scotland <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's a factor that, no, that there's, there's, um, it is difficult getting, trying to get yeah. a particular food. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't, because I, obviously I live in London, I'm totally spoilt, and um, I think there's a few, several years ahead of food trends, hmm. every single shop around me has kefir and kombucha uh, and kimchi, um, and yet, you know, but they didn't five years ago, and so I think they will find their hmm. way. And, and similarly in the US, I think there are hot spots where, you know, you can get the latest foods and others where it is harder. But, um, yeah, I appreciate, uh, you know, it sounds a bit elitist sometimes to talk about all these foods, but um, uh, I think they will, they will, these, you know, people will understand what foods are healthy and then they'll demand it and then the retailers will get them. Mm. The kefir is fairly standard now, but the, the kimchi is not that available, so... You've got to look around for. I actually work with. You Koreans can make your own, you know. You can. Yeah, <laughs> I actually work with Koreans in in a, in a university in in Cambodia, and they had kimchi with every meal: breakfast, lunch, dinner. No, and no, they, they have the metabolic health to prove it. it it's uh, it's it's all it's all there. Well, they are. Yeah, they are one of the healthiest uh, populations who, and certainly of the of the developed countries that have rapidly uh, got rich mm. they're the ones that haven't got fat mm. and diabetes and I think it is interesting how they made, because in the 1960s they were a very poor country and uh, the South Koreans have uh, shot up you know, to uh, the same living standards as, as the UK and the US without getting the, the obesity mm. uh, epidemic and diabetes epidemic and I think we have to look at some of the things they're doing right. And uh, it is keeping traditional foods, I think, is one of them, even if it seems strange to us to have a very strong garlicky uh, chili uh, fermented food for breakfast. Um, 
if it works, well, you know, don't knock it, um, copy it. Better yeah, there, there, there's better a group than, of, uh, you know, frost, frosties. Yeah, there's a group of 40, 50 academics who I was working with and, and medics, and uh, none of them were overweight. Um, it, was, it was quite noticeable, actually. It was, um, yeah. So just before we go to look at the Zoe data, Tim, I just want to just reassure people I've no financial interest in this. This is a genuine belief in getting huge numbers of people in to contribute to citizen science, to give us data that really isn't available any other way apart from mass participation. And, and now we have these apps and things, we can do this. So I think we really are on, on the cusp of, of a new a new era in, in, in uh, mass participation science, which um, I certainly find fascinating and it's your full-time job. So uh, that's just the reason why I'm doing this. So I'm going to share the screen here, Tim, if we yeah, can. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it, it is totally free as well. So mm. um, it, it's it's not it's not connected to any commercial product mm. or anything, and it, it is it is free. And I think the whole idea is that people do things themselves, and we've got you know the idea is you want to add in people measuring their own blood pressures and measuring their heart rates and sleep and all these other things, so they can compare. And maybe we can start to get community groups working within them that can even suggest the next trial uh, and things like this. So I think it potentially very empowering for people to sort of, you know, self-direct their own personal health care whilst also doing, uh, adding to research. So mm. without needing lengthy grants and, uh, you know, five years of applications uh, to do it. And, and as always, we promised, like with the COVID app, to give the data back immediately to people, not wait years for the publication. Yeah, there's that instant gratification angle there. there isn't like there? Mm, you just get, you get the data within, within yeah. days. It's, uh, it really, really is very satisfying. And it's also science that's medical science that's not uh, limited by um, the, the randomised double-blind controlled trials, which might be quite expensive or, of course, are very expensive. Uh, and uh, might be done with people with a commercial interest in a particular product, whereas this is this is a democratisation um, of health. So I'm going to share this screen, Tim, and we'll have a quick look at the Zoe data, if, if you don't mind running through it. Just make sure I'm getting the right... Uh, been, been giving people the right impression over the past few weeks. I'm sure you have. 